which was about the sort of a loss of civility and the decline in the quality of the faith in the United States Senate. It's a terrific piece. Um, and from there, I've sent him a dozen pieces, and he to me, uh, we've talked on a very regular basis. And when we put together a year of activity at college, Brooks was not only an active participant, probably a major event in that, um, but was sort of a conscience and uh, consultant for me as we tried to figure out what to do. So that's the background of what brought me here. I'm happy to be part of this conversation today. Thank you. It has been a conversation that has continued over a significant period of time and one that I have enjoyed and thought was of enormous importance for many reasons. Uh, one being my own experience in various parts of the world dealing with the rule of law, working with the prosecutors, most particularly the Balkans, which has been ravaged uh, less than 20 years, the last 15 years, by the Bosnia and Mexico. And I'm on my way to Serbia, the judges just in the month. Uh, so, seeing a breakdown not only of civility but of civil society in general, and maybe I'm really aware of the pattern, what the stakes are, what possibly in the worst extreme to lose. The other piece of that, in terms of my own inclinations toward this conversation, has been what many have recognized, and we've all heard the comment and the commentary and the debate about the decline in professionals within the legal community. Back in the 90s, uh, when I was on the U.S. District Court, I participated in numerous programs and seminars with bar associations and related discussing the perceived decline in civility in legal practice in the way we treat one another uh, so often prevalent in discovery but in other fora as well. So these experiences, like Tom's experiences in Northern Ireland, Ireland made me particularly inclined to engage in the sort of discussion we've had up to this point, and I was uh, part of uh, the program that was a very, very significant piece of his first year uh, as president of my wishes. We're going to kick it off. I'm going to show you a couple of clips. The first is actually about five minutes uh, from remarks that I made in our college community. We all stayed at the college address at the middle of the year. This was delivered about a month after the events of Tucson. Get a sense of what is our stake as an institution of higher education um, in this issue. Um, so we'll start with that. A lot has happened since uh, we last spoke in this kind of formal setting in college, um, in our country, um, in the world. Uh, most recently, I think the Japanese earthquake and tsunami, the escalating engagement in Libya and the daily reports on the new policies of our new government are all competing for our attention. And I know that we all be here about what happens uh, on all of us. We're all, in many ways, caught up the crosshairs of those issues. I've been focused on a little bit too, but I've also been focused on something else in the last few months. Uh, but I've also been a few minutes long at the beginning. Um, and then we went to sort of a more formal uh, state of college address. The topic I've been focused on undergirds the debate on those other issues, like Japan and Libya and state government in Pennsylvania. And that's a very simple issue, simple name, civil discourse. Um, I think we all recall uh, the shootings in Tucson where a congresswoman, a nine year old girl, a federal judge, a social worker, a great grandmother. A retired construction worker, and a woman who was celebrating 55 years of marriage to a high school sweetheart were all done down in front of the supermarket during the Congress on the corner of the event. There's been a furious and occasionally uncivil debate over whom, if any, 
symposium that the judge participated in on this subject. Uh, but we did a series of things in the course of the year. Uh, one of them was we have an annual lecture called the Moral Choices Lecture. And we had other things like death and dying, energy and the environment, etc. This year we had our Moral Choices. We brought in uh, a woman from uh, who runs the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania, Kathleen Hall Jameson, uh, who's made a career out of investigating sort of the ethics of public speech. Um, it's really been her life's work. Um, and her latest trial is a website called Flat Check. Fact Check has been there for a long time, and you can go into that and, and really find out whether the facts you're hearing in public life are true. Flat Check is designed for sort of the blogosphere, uh, cable news programs, and everything else to verify the accuracy of what's on there. She showed us a clip when she delivered the Moral Choices Lecture uh, that we want to share with you, in which they took uh, literally 38 statements, you're not going to see all of this, you can see about, about five minutes of this. But what they looked for was, you know, absolutely counterbalanced, uncivil discourse from both sides of the political line. Um, so you'll see a Democrat uh, calling someone something related to Nazism, and you'll see a Republican doing the same thing. We wanted you to hear this cacophony of voices, because even though we're in a college setting and you're in a judicial setting, this is the context that, that we all live in that all, many of the people who appear in front of you on a daily basis are witnessing this kind of language um, all the time. The fact of the hospital is dispensing questions. How did MSNBC, CNN, and Fox cover 38 uncivil statements, including analogies to Nazi Germany? And you mean when John Boehner played golf with President Obama? Come on. Come on. It'd be like Hitler playing golf with Netanyahu. A big lie, just like girls. Extreme characterizations of opponents. Growing laws occupying Wall Street. The only folks keeping the barbarians in the gates. The language of violence. We were pretty pretty of it. Let's take these son of bitches out. Extreme characterizations of legislation. The Republican out there plan is this. Die quickly. Democrats released a health care bill which essentially said to America's seniors, drop dead. Allegations that the president lied. Last year, they accused President Bush of being a liar, really. And dismissive references to others. Newt Gingrich is a fat, repulsive pig. So we know you're hooking it, but you're just not cheap. This lobbyist is K Street 4. They understand there's a little bit of uptakeism. They just make up stuff. got much more media attention than others. When this happened, we paired a highly covered single instance from one ideological side with multiple less covered instances from the other side. For example, really? Bush and his administration had lied to the world. I came here last year and accused President Bush of being a liar. A year later, I feel no reason to apologize or change my opinion. Have called the President a liar a couple times because we lied to him. Die quickly! Places like Kennedy, United Kingdom, and Europe, people die over their life because it will not put seniors in a position of being put to death by their government. Democrats released a health care bill which essentially said to America's seniors, drop dead. Partisan cable shows magnify their viewers' sense that those on the other side are to blame for instability. Overall, MSNBC polices conservative transgressions more often than liberal ones, and Fox does the opposite. CNN was the outlier in the study because it was more likely to flag cases of instability for both sides. MSNBC did this. What a ridiculous comment comparing Obama to Hitler invading Poland. And Fox did this. Protester signs and they're comparing Scott Walker to Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. He's got, you know, lock and reload. A Fox viewer could learn. As we reported last night, Congressman Alan Grayson, a Democrat from Atlanta, Florida, has said a number of irresponsible things. The latest outrage, calling this female lobbyist a fool. Well, those two to MSNBC would learn. So we know you're hooking, but you're just not cheap. At the end of the same attack of verbal diarrhea, Beth concluded, I guess shame is dead. Shame died. What would you know about shame? Although both networks covered the controversy over Governor Palin's use of the term blood libel, 
journalists and pundits should not manufacture a blood libel. MSNBC devoted a greater number of segments to it. A blood libel. A blood libel. Day two of fallout from Sarah Palin's use of the term blood libel. By contrast, Fox was more likely to feature Vice President Biden's characterization of Labor's opponents. You are the only folks keeping the barbarians in the gate. Uh, you're the only ones keeping the barbarians from the gates. Republicans are like barbarians at the gate. The differences between MSNBC and Fox are statistically significant. So you can guess which feature. But doesn't it seem like Chelsea's sort of being pimped out in some weird sort of way? Probably a horrible comment. Pimping her something out. He's getting the shoes to this event. And which featured this? A fist bump, a pound, a terrorist fist jab. One person suggests that it's a fist bump. It's pretty simple, as most people in this country know. It's a fist bump. Well, the internet. Radio and 24 hour cable news networks have increased awareness of offensive words and deeds that might have gone unreported in an earlier media age. Repeated play of single instances of rude, crude, or lewd political language and behavior probably makes it seem more prevalent than it actually is. Despite this pattern, we found most outlets agree that comparisons to Hitler, Goebbels, Nazis, or the Holocaust were out of bounds. There are people alive today who barely survived the Holocaust, and there are many people alive today whose whole families were killed in the Holocaust. Nazism is not a metaphor for a political policy you disagree with. If everybody we don't like is a Nazi, what word do we reserve for Hitler? I mean, we should just get one thing straight, that the only people who are Nazis are Nazis. Overall, the partisan media are not interested in asking how typical is uncivil behavior and uncivil language on the other side. <laughs> Uh, it was 
was a program in which uh, a former dean of a law school, actually of two law schools, John Murray, I don't know whether he had moved to Duquesne, but you were there, Julie, he had been at Pitt before, but eventually on to, uh, on to Duquesne. David Shriven, who among other things has been uh, the uh, editor uh, of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette,
fact of the matter is, to reduce these concepts to everything we do in life, <clears throat> at the only life worth living, I think, is the virtuous life. We forgot um, that when this country was founded, notwithstanding the incredible debates among our founding fathers, with the name calling that would rather some the name calling it today, <clears throat> They all agreed upon one concept, and the concept was very simply this. We cannot have a republic unless you have virtuous citizenry. When Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention, someone said to him, Mr. Franklin, what do we have? Do we have a monarchy? Do we have a republic? He said, we have a republic if you can keep it. Courts are called upon from time to time as they were in the cases that I briefly referenced, because school districts chose to discipline students through a formal disciplinary process, which is the, the use of the power of the state to try to control what students had said. And our group, in several cases, stated quite clearly that this constituted a violation of students' First Amendment rights. So, Courts have been looked to, as I think everyone here knows, more and more in the last several generations to sometimes seek to solve our problems, but we are not some brooding omnipresence in the sky that is able to come down and solve all your problems. We are not some deus ex machina that's run on the stage at a point of emergency and can provide great wisdom to solve every problem. And so, don't expect in an age of increasing incivility to see the courts be able to prescribe a, a means by which discourse can be made more civil, more hospitable to every audience. It is going to happen anywhere, and God knows it has not been happening of late or for some time in the political arena. It is here. It is on the campus. It is through instruction. It is through the kind of tension of rubbing the elbows with your fellows and with those who maybe don't share a great deal in common with you. Uh, that you develop an understanding and appreciation of others' views. The culture of the campus, the culture of the university can, I think, contribute to that in ways that, that courts will fail woefully to accomplish. We, we ended with that little piece from, from the judge, and you should know that among many reasons that we wanted the judge to be on the panel, he had recently, before that symposium, written a concurring opinion in a case involving a, a fake Facebook page uh, created by a student Narrows very quickly a uh, principle um, and trying to figure out where do we draw the next yelling fire in a crowded theater online. Of course, the judge is being down the side of the First Amendment, and, and as he made clear in that segment, we can't really expect the courts to solve some of these kinds of issues in the face of the First Amendment. Let me ask the question a little different way, Judge. Do you think that there are, in this broad definition of civil discourse issues, um, in courtrooms today, are there more of them, um, or in the legal practice in, in general? Has, has what has happened in society at large happened in the legal profession as well? I think it would be interesting uh, for probably even me to uh, hear from some of the people who are here today. Uh, I have uh, not been in the trial courtroom now, it's getting close to 10 years. Uh, it's been that long since I was a real judge, but I uh, do have some keen recollections of many things that I, I witnessed. And uh, certainly, I guess I could be taken in that, from that clip as being something of a proponent of judicial minimalism. Uh, there's not a lot we can do to impose civility, but I think that uh, legal practitioners and trial judges have an enormous opportunity in their own worlds 
that do something about it. I remember very keenly participating in a lot of programs back uh, in my years on the district board, which sought to improve the level of professionalism. And often that was just a euphemism for the relations between lawyers and the relations between lawyers and the court. And you would hear some pretty awful and pretty extreme uh, stories about events that would go on uh, in courtrooms, yes, so often in discovery. And everybody who's been a judge knows that resolving discovery disputes are just really the greatest. Uh, I guess this is a real story. I can have this question come before me, but another judge did. This was actually a portion of a transcript from a deposition that got up to the court for resolution on sanctions, and I'll recount it in expletive deleted form. Here uh, is attorney one. You don't run this deposition. You understand? Attorney two. Neither do you, Joe. Attorney one. You watch and see. You watch and see who does, big boy. And don't be telling other lawyers to shut up. That isn't your GD job, fat boy. Attorney two. Well, that's not your job, Mr. Harris. <laughs> At this point, the unfortunate witness in the deposition attempted to continue his testimony. <laughs> As I said before, you have an incipient, at which point he's interrupted, and attorney one, what do you want to know about it, H? Attorney two, you're not going to bully this guy. Attorney one, oh, you big tub of S blank blank blank, sit down. Attorney two, I don't care how many of you come up against me. Attorney one, oh, you big tub of S dash dash dash, sit down, sit down, you fat tub of S. This is not a like this course, needless to say, uh, but it is an example from quite a few vignettes that I encountered in the years of doing uh, programs on professionals. Were they sanctioned, Judge? Uh, in this case, most certainly. Uh, they, they were sanctioned. I mean, we have a case uh, from our court that uh, arose out of the Virgin Islands case, another dispute where one of the participants who is now in the Virgin Islands told the other lawyer to go do something to himself. Uh, there were sanctions imposed there, although the biggest discussion on our court was whether or not we should use the actual words in the opinion or whether we should use abbreviations or just how we should go about handling this. this uh, I don't know whether you all have experienced uh, a worsening of this situation, whether you have seen a continuation of the same uh, decline in manners between lawyers or whether, uh, whether it has improved. But the fact of the matter is there is a great deal of literature within the profession, within those who write for our publications, uh, that there has been such a decline that mirrors what we have been talking about in the society of We wanted to pick the legal profession not just because you're all lawyers, but because we generally think of it as a
But it turns out it's also true in that one-to-one engagement. Um, when you say something negative to somebody, uh, the psychological studies will show you it's, it's perceived in, in a uh, almost a Neanderthal way. It, it goes right to your defenses. You know, when somebody says something negative to you, and you actually hear that better and understand it better than when something uh, positive um, is said to you. So it's you know, there's clearly those kind of things um, aren't going to work. But let me ask you, and then we'll come back to that sort of general notion, because I think we can talk about it with different accounts. What about things in court? Somebody asked about um, sanctions. Is there anything that clearly doesn't work in courtrooms or litigation strategies for these kinds of things? First of all, everybody here knows, because they've been in courtrooms, that judges can only do so much and judges should only Lawyers have to be able to try their cases. Lawyers have to be able to represent clients with vigor, with zeal. And lawyers need to be given a considerable amount of leeway in doing so. Uh, we all know the obvious remedies, so to speak, that exist for missteps by politicians. Citations, sanctions. Uh, I, in my years as a trial judge, I know I can count on one hand the number of times I imposed sanctions and still have a few fingers left. I hate it. I've never cited anyone for contempt uh, in all the years I was a trial judge. Uh, certainly, that's not to say that it shouldn't be done. It's not to say that those sanctions don't work. But when you really have to pull the trigger to that extent, you allow the problem to get way far out of hand. And besides that, the people, the practitioners, and there are none in this room, but I don't know many of you, those who I do know, I can say that certainly with experience, uh, who ever needed or deserved that kind of approval by a judge. The people who have those sorts of impositions placed upon them are the ones, unfortunately, who are usually beyond training further and beyond uh, remedial steps, uh, so that there's very little deterrence on the brain, uh, which, again, brings us back to how do you really uh, educate someone? How do you really, at the early stages, encourage people to be understanding of one another's rights and sensitivity. And where does that start? And what can you do about it? The education process. Um, the, uh, I'm not closer to hear what Judge Murray said, but one of the conversations that uh, uh, Dr. Murray said, what Judge Smith and I talked about after that event was we really were struck by, by his comments about the end is down to the fundamental values, you know, and, and how you fought. And I've got a big secret now. The judge is our commencement speaker this year at Mount Washington. So I asked him a week ago, what are you thinking of talking about? And uh, this is a fundamental value of so this work. He's going to talk about listening. Um, he's going to talk about listening. And that is a great way for us to conclude our academic year period, but especially the year in which we, we, we've tried to focus on on those kind of issues. Um, we, we've also been talking about, just in general, you know, we put some focus on the legal profession. We certainly don't think that's an area that's a primary problem in civil discourse. But in general, you know, what kind of things, and I don't think we'll go through it, but we've been going through lists, depending on the venue, you know, the impeachment etiquette, you know, net etiquette, you know, for people on the net, the case the judge had. Do you make professional organizations have civil discourse as a requirement for their CLE and, and things like that. But I, in last last week, I told the judge, when Captain Paul Jamison came to the college, and I, I just want to share this piece with her, uh, uh, she recommended, I did a little research, and uh, she was proposing that we adopt what she called Jefferson's rules for the House of Representatives. Uh, it turns out Jefferson had written some rules. If you go into the CRS and, and check it out, 
They're not exactly the rules of the House now. But here were the rules that he proposed, which we thought were very interesting in the lunchtime conversation because we realized they don't just apply to the House. They apply to all kinds of discourse in a civil society. The first rule was no ad hominems. You know, no ad hominems. Um, the, the, the catchy Latin phrase was qui degreditur a material ad persona. That was actually Jefferson's right. But rule one of the House of Representatives of Jefferson was do not attack a person. You know, do not attack a person. Not relevant in these kind of conversations. Rule number two, and this did come out of his Jefferson's rules. The third rule turned out to be not. Rule number two is basically you have to be germane. You know, you have to talk to the issue at hand. You know, follow that simple rule. Um, and I thought that's a pretty good rule as well. You know, and also kind of an extension of the the no ad hominem attacks. But I thought the third one was the real key and applies in lots of circumstances. And it turns out it's not a, a specific rule that he wrote down in a document that you could find called Jefferson's Rules, but it certainly was the import of all of the rules that he wrote for the House. And a lot of his rules have been incorporated. If you now went and looked up the rules of the House of Representatives, you'll see a lot of his rules are sprinkled in there. But the third rule was basically don't conduct yourself in a way that wouldn't bring credit to the institution. You know, pretty broad, pretty good idea um, um, for the House. And I think if we had you know, more, especially in the last rule, you know, across the professions, um, in politics, in legal practice, in academia, um, on the internet, um, those kind of things, I think would be a better place. And really, you know, back to, to, uh, to Dr. Berry's recounting uh, and his conversation about fundamental values. But any thoughts on sort of the generic answers? I, I, I'd like to go back and make one point of clarification and then expand on something you had commented on earlier before we showed the clip of our panel and particularly of the Truman's comments I indicated that wasn't sure that I had agreed with some points he made and was not that he said on this clip. I think he and I differed somewhat on the historical context. He was a bit more sanguine than I had all of that that what we're witnessing uh, is at most cyclical uh, and perhaps just simply uh, what we see from one generation to the next in political uh, discourse that sometimes it's worse than it is at other times. I'm more concerned about the cacophony. I'm more concerned about the phenomenon, the electronic phenomenon that you mentioned. And that is uh, the, the various outlets, the numerous outlets uh, in the time of Lincoln, in the time of Jefferson, we had an absolutely scurrilous press much of the time. Lincoln was called uh, the gorilla. Uh, political adversaries back in the earliest days of this republic called each other uh, the heart of the day. So it's not that this is anything new. Uh, a lot of the public was illiterate then either. They didn't read newspapers. Now it seems that everyone uh, who is capable of constructing even the portion of a sentence, and often that portion is not fit to print, is able to uh, really uh, place that out there in maybe not public discourse, uh, which is what we had in this case that you mentioned that was before our court, that I am really concurring in. Uh, and it's a problem that faces the public schools today. And that is, what do you do? about students who get something that and says perfectly atrocious things and, and nasty and cruel things. But it's not being done on the college campus. It's not being done within the schoolhouse gates to use the metaphor that's used in the jurisprudence. And that was our case. It was a young woman who had her grandmother sat on a Facebook page. She said these horrible things, so she did nothing to actually place them within the schoolhouse gate and access to it. She did nothing within the school. And, uh, and our members uh, found that what had happened when the school district disciplined her uh, was a violation of her First Amendment rights. And I agree with that. But I went farther uh, on, on a jurisprudential point, and uh, which had to do with the line of the case at the beginning of the case. I believe that the thing was, was The bottom line, and in 
partial response to your question a minute ago about what courts can do. Do we have a robust First Amendment jurisprudence in this country? Yes, we should. And we need to avoid government taking steps that make sure that happens. What can we do, though, to encourage Anyway, our 
point of showing you this at the very end is the stakes are high. Um, and that really is the essence of, of my uh, closing remarks. The stakes are very high. Um, civil discourse really is the glue uh, that enables us to operate as a democracy. You know, the ability to think critically, uh, to listen, uh, to object perfectly, but after you've given a person on the other side uh, the opportunity to hear you. Uh, I heard a dialogue, and I'll finish with this, um, on, uh, it was a Bill Warner's program, and he had real combatants in front of him. Uh, some of the people you saw in the sort of cacophony clip earlier. And, and these were his words. This was him closing on the program, because he came to no resolution. You know, he, he wasn't able to be a mediator at all between uh, these blogosphere and cable media show people that he had a dialogue with. And he finished with this. He said, I'm reminded of a story from folklore about the tribal elder telling his grandson about the battle the old man was waging within himself. He said, quote, my son, it is between two wolves. One is an evil wolf, anger, envy, sorrow, greed, self-pity, guilt, resentment, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is the good wolf, joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith, end quote. The young boy took this in for a few minutes, and then he asked, which wolf won? And his grandfather answered, the one I feed. The one I feed. So too, America's public life. The wolf that wins is the wolf we feed. Um, and we didn't get to this part of our conversation, but we live in a world where you know, we're the people watching these things. We're the people inviting these things into our home. Sometimes we're the people practicing you know, that kind of discourse. The wolf we feed is the wolf that wins. Um, and at the end of the day, capacity to engage in civil conversation, I think, really is the glue uh, that makes a democracy like ours work. And I'm very concerned about whether that glue um, uh, is still in sufficient supply. Let me ask the judge that word. And I share that concern. One that literally stared me right in the face earlier today as I was driving to my chambers. A judge, as we all know, cannot be involved in any way in political activity in relation to the state judge or other uh, Otherwise, matters political or out of bounds, in that sense it should be. Uh, so I have no views, at least ones that I can probably share, but as I drove to my office this morning, I was confronted by a large SUV in front of me with a political design. Now, I'm not much into bumper sticker mentalities. I think that they do often tend to reduce matters to absurd, uh, absurd minimalism. Uh, in this case, I could not avoid what was in front of me, and this gentleman's entitled to his opinion. But it was using the name of President Obama as an acronym, O-B-A-M-A, -A, one big ass mistake in America. Large letters, a large sign staring you in the face whether you wanted to see it or not. And that to me is, uh, not exactly my idea, but like this, of course. And perhaps a small symptom of, uh, of what we have in terms of the decline in political debate. Anyone can think that, anybody can say it in their homes when they have to look at it uh, on, on a public thoroughfare. The second point is this, and it takes me back to the political campaign many years ago. My dear friend, Susan Bray, is here this evening. Uh, Susan and I were contestants 27 years ago. Yes, it was 27 years ago. She's only 29. <laughs> One of us at least looks that way. But a more simple campaign could not have been run at the time, in my view. And that is a tribute to her. And I can say it by contrast, because if you remember, 
there was a judicial race across the line in another county that year, which was not quite as uh, as civil. And I can remember Jim Roach saying at a meeting, because I believe he was president of the bar that year, uh, congratulating the two candidates in this county for having conducted such a civil campaign compared to what had gone on. And I can't help but mention you know, your old home county. But uh, that's the way it should be. That's the way I remember 27 years ago, and that's the way I hope uh, we will see uh, this year unfold, although I have no realistic hopes in that regard. Let us hope that the tenor of the next day will be with you. Thanks very much. Thank you. 